Hey everyone, now welcome back to the channel. Uh, today we are going to be reviewing the Canon R10. And today I'm running the 1 to 500 with it. It's a pretty good little run and gun combo. And uh, it's uh, snowing leaves on me right now. It's fall here in Alaska. And that also means bull moose and the moose rut. So I hope you guys aren't sick of moose already because you're probably gonna get a few more videos of the moose in them because right now that's what we're doing here in Alaska. We're chasing moose because they're tussling, they're fighting. They got big, beautiful racks. And they're just so gorgeous, especially with all this fall foliage all around me. Uh, leaves are falling pretty fast here. But uh, that's what we're gonna do today. We're going to review this camera. And I actually see a little bull over here with the cow just over this ridge. I'm gonna take a couple pictures of them. Then I'm gonna come back to you and we'll start talking about this camera. Talk to you in a bit. What do you know, you guys? I get out here to chase some moose and review the R10. And it was nice and sunny all morning through the early afternoon. I get out here in the late afternoon, clouds roll in. Never fails. Uh, but it is good diffuse light because normally, if the light was full sun blue, it'd be really hard to see right now. So, I guess one saving grace is I've got diffuse light to shoot through. But that's not what we're here for, we're talking about the R10 today. And I've run about 10,000 shots of this thing, and I've had it for about a month, so let's talk about it. The first thing is, is we always talk about the feel and the body construction and how it's made. Uh, it's made out of polycarbonate. It is not as robust, it is a lot lighter than the R7. Uh, it is a little tighter here where you put your fingers in the hand grip. Uh, I know with the 2470 that I used briefly, it was a little tight back here where you put your hands uh, in that spot. Uh, with the 100-500, the 100-400 uh, RF, the uh, even my uh, big 500 Prime, it, it's got enough room in here. So unless you're shooting that 24 to 70 or so like the 85-12, if you're running this camera, you probably don't have those lenses. You may. Um, I should say that, and I'm running a 500 Prime, and so uh, depends on what you need the camera for, right? Uh, but the build quality is pretty good. Um, it is not weather sealed. One thing you want to do is go to lens coat or someplace like that and get you their rain coat. And that will be a cover that covers this camera, which I have in my bag right now because it could start raining on me and this is going in the bag as soon as it had happens. Uh, but yeah, so it's not weather sealed. Um, it is also not image stabilized, the body. Now, if you're shooting video, there's a digital stabilization that's pretty good. Um, with like with all of the R series cameras, the R, the RP, the R5, 7, R, R3 a little bit, um, when you film yourself, there is wobble in that because we're not backside limited. The R3 is not as backside, back, backside limited, but there's a little bit of wobble Canon's been known for. Um, so when you're walking, don't be doing a lot of jittery. If you look at my uh, Bloody Moose video towards the end when I'm standing talking, you'll see that the trees and stuff sometimes kind of wobble a little bit. And that's what this will do. Uh, unless you're looking for it, you probably won't even notice it. But when you do know it's there, it'll bug you. Like it'll bug you, bug you, bug you, bug you. Uh, what else? Um, as far as use on this thing, as far as the body, uh, the flip screen is great. Um, any camera that has a flip screen is awesome because it's variable, right? So if you're on the ground, like I know some other cans, like the Nikon and some others, they only have a. Uh, some of the Sony's only have a back tilt. They don't completely come out to the side like this. Uh, the reason that is, if you're going to film yourself or set it on a tripod or stuff, you do have that flip screen out. It's also great for when you're uh, shooting like this, you're shooting portraits, you want to get low on the ground, you can see what you're shooting, you don't have to get down on the ground sometimes. Uh, and if you're shooting low on the ground like this, you can also tilt it up. So the tilt screens are really good for 
getting low, and that's one of the things I, I preach. Get low, get low, get low. Get that low shot. Get down at that animal's eye level or lower if you can. What else on this camera? Yes, this up here. This is a active hot shoe. So what that means is you can plug in a speed light, a microphone, anything that will connect here to not have to connect cables to it because it actually has it right there. Uh, you do have a remote shutter here on the side. Uh, there's a mic port over here, HDMI port, and a USB port. It's a micro HDMI, so be careful with that. I think the first time I was hooking up my Atomos, I got a uh, mini HDMI, not the micro. The micro is a little bitty one, and I had to send that back, so that was fun. Uh, it does not have a headphone jack. I've never used a headphone jack on a camera ever. Uh, for the SD card slot and the battery, they're in the same spot. They're here on the bottom. And it has only a single SD card slot. Uh, I've never shot redundant. Um, I probably should, but I never have. I've always had just one card in my camera. Uh, the battery is different than the R5 and the R7. It's an LP17, not an LPN 6H. It is smaller, and I'll talk about this later. And uh, RF mount, of course, like all the R cameras are. It'll shoot EF and RF with an adapter for the EF lenses. Uh, it shoots all the lenses great. Um, this lens works great. All the RF lenses work great with it. The EF7200 works great with it. The 500F4 Prime I have shoots great with it, but it will eat the batteries, bigger motors, so it drains the battery. Get about half the life out of this battery as I would normally if I'm not using that 500 Prime. I know the 7200 eats the battery a little faster than this guy, all the RF lenses does. So it takes a little more to drive those motors and those EF lenses. So these battery does go down quicker. Uh, one thing about the battery right now, for me anyway, uh, it's a little hard to get hold of this uh, LP 17 h battery that goes, and that's a smaller one. Uh, there's third party batteries, but I don't trust them. Um, leaves are falling and smacking me in the head here. So it's, it's lovely. Uh, that's it. I think as far as body and build, uh, it is super light, by the way. With this plus the one to 500, this is less than 200, two, sorry, 200, less than two pounds is what this rig would run. This one right here is still really light. This is a great run and gun combo right now with this, but the one to 400 would be even better. Great hiking rig. I'm not gonna go into the settings and the setup on this camera. You can go look at the uh, full setup video I did on this camera and how to set it up. If you wanna see that, I'll, I'll have a link for that in the description on how to set the camera up. So I'm really not gonna cover that in this video. I'm just gonna cover what I know of this camera, what I think of this camera, and what I've experienced from this camera. The image quality of this camera is great. Uh, the dynamic range is not as good as, as the higher level cameras. This is a different sensor than all the other cameras. Each camera has a different sensor in it. That's why the different price ranges. And since this one's the lowest one, the APS-C, it has probably the weakest sensor out of all the whole series. Now, that's not a bad thing. The weakest, you know, the weakest uh, F1 car is still a fast F1 car, right? And uh, that's the difference in this camera. So with that different sensor in here, that affects a few things. One is, like we talked in the last video about the ISO performance, that's one thing it'll affect. So you saw that it will, you know, 10,000 lower, you're pretty good. Probably if you're gonna frame a picture 6,400 or lower, if you're gonna blow it up real big, that's where I would feel comfortable with this camera shooting. As opposed to the other cameras, I can get up to 16, 20,000. You know, I can shoot in that range and still maybe be able to do something with the image. Uh, with good light, nice little leaf there, you could push this a little higher in the full sun day, but in the low light conditions, you wanna go lower. And it is raining leaves all over me. So if I end up having a leaf on top of my head for half the video, you know why. So the uh, so back to the image quality, It like I said, it has a little less, less dynamic range. And one thing you'll notice when you've got pictures come out here in raw, they'll look a little hotter. By hotter, I mean you'll see the greens and the yellows and everything will be a little, little more brighter and than you would with, say, the R5 or the R7, especially the R5. So the more dynamic range in a picture you have with the RAW, the flatter the image looks when you put it out right out of the camera. And so you want that so you got, when it's more flatter looking, you know you can recover more and add more colors and more darks and shadows and things like that with your image. It's just a little hotter, you know, you can't push it as far. And sometimes I have to dial back the greens and stuff in this camera uh, from the RAW. But uh, otherwise, You'll see that the uh, the bloody moose image, uh, everything after I broke, we came back from Katmai after about two or three weeks, I think there's three or four videos that are labeled Canon R10. 
they were completely shot with the video and the images of the Canon R10, and the images are beautiful. The moose shots I've taken are gorgeous. Some of the, the you know the big bouquet shots and things like that, the rim light shots and the moose, they, they've been great. So the image quality is phenomenal with this camera. Uh, but it is less than the R7 and the R5, but it should be because the price point breaks and the features in it. Uh, the video capabilities of the camera, great. It uh, shoots 4K 60, it shoots uh, oversampled, it'll shoot 4K uh, 30, 24, uh, it'll shoot 1080p at high frame, uh, 1080p high frame rate 120. Uh, so all the slow-mo footage you've seen in the last few videos, those are all done with this camera. And it's, it's beautiful. It looks great. It does not have C-Log 3, so if you like to color grade, uh, you can't do that with this camera. I believe there's a way to make you get a log in here through some little uh, some software firmware updates you could do. I, I, I wouldn't trust that too much unless you really know what you're doing, especially this level of camera. I just would not worry about it. It only shoots 10 bit and if you know much about video that'll make sense to you if you're doing hdr and i don't so even the video i've been shooting has not been in 10 bits for the last few videos and it looks really good still so uh for you if you're doing just for youtube uh it's fine it's gonna be great it looks good i think even the last video i did end up only being 1080p because i messed up with the iso performance the first frame i dropped onto my timeline was a 1080p high uh, high speed one and so it set my whole frame at 1080p. I don't recognize it till I was uploading it to YouTube. It was like, oops, but still looks good. You can still zoom in and look at everything. I've watched the video, my own video a couple times and zoomed in with the TV. Still looks good at 1080p. So don't worry about that. If you're a video shooter, uh, video shooting is so fun, especially if you shoot your birds and your moose or bears or deer or whatever you got in your area and shoot it in 120 frames a second. It just looks so cool. It just moves everything out. But anyway, let's move on to the next subject. And that's going to be the autofocus. That is where this camera blows the doors off everything else. Oh, I'm raining leaves on my head. Um, <laughs> sorry, getting the leaves off of me. Autofocus, that's what we're talking about here. That is where this camera shines. At the price range it is, this is what's going to blow your doors off. Eye autofocus, vehicle autofocus, you know, people... It's amazing. It will lock on. Even the Moose, it will it locks on really close to the same as the R7 and the R5. Now, here's where we talk about that sensor difference. Since the sensor is not as good as the other two, it will lack there because where the where the autofocus works is when it's got contrast in subjects. So it's got to be able to make out the difference in the head and the eye and the body and the head and all that. It's got to know, know the parts of the thing. So that's why with the moose, it's really hard to shoot because the moose's head and sides and, and everything, except for his antlers, it's all about the same color. It, very seldom you see that white of a moose's eye unless he's really looking extreme to the left or right because his eyes just cover the same color. So when you hit the autofocus, like what you'll see in some of these Atomos shots, is it's grabbing the whole head, you know, the little dots like it's looking at a, a wall or something, or it will grab the head or it'll grab the antler or it'll grab the whole body. Um, there's a few times when it's you're really close to the moose and it, the moose moves its eye or is looking down and you'll see white and then it'll, it'll jump to it for about that long and jump off. Now, where does this sensor with autofocus have issues? This one has when you've got a tree, bird in a tree, stationary, and you're holding that autofocus down. Don't hold it down too long. What you want to do is hold it down and get lock on that bird as long as it's not moving. Uh, it, we hear it when I say moving. Is it's not moving backwards and forwards from you it's moving left and right you're fine remember you're talking about focal plane when you lock this camera onto something it's going to hit that spot and if you let off it's going to stay in that spot and anything that's in that plane however big your depth of field is it will stay in focus so if you got a small bird in there and he's on a tree limb and you got him in focus and he doesn't move more than a few inches or a few feet towards you or back from you don't hit that focus button again because what will happen is it'll focus on that subject. And, and as long as you hold that down, it's still looking. I'm looking for an eye. I'm looking for an eye. It's what the camera's saying all the time. I'm looking for that eye. Looking for that head. Looking for that body. Looking for that animal. So it's constantly searching. It's using its AI and its machine learning that's learned when it you know, was, came out of the factory, whatever was on this chip. It's doing all those algorithm changes, looking, determining what an animal is. And if that bird turns his head far enough where his eye goes away, and maybe he's the same color like a brown creeper on a tree like I've got here, he blends into that tree or a woodpecker. He may blend on the tree, depends on how he's sitting. 
If it doesn't see that red or that eye, it may lose focus. So it's doing all that and you're holding that focus down. Even with the R5 and the R7 and the R3, don't hold it down constantly because what it's gonna do, it's gonna jump to something else like the woodpecker video. If you watch that one, when I talked about the R7 uh, with that, when they're talking about, you know, getting ready for that camera and the ISO performance, there was a nod above the woodpecker's head that it would jump to. And this camera will do the same thing. Uh, when I first got it, I had the same thing that like Dwayne Patton has a couple things he talked about with the R7 even would pull, jump, it would kind of have loose focus. And the R10 would do the same thing. I noticed that when I first got this, I had a few instances where that happened. I had a black bear, real big in the frame. And when it went to focus, it couldn't find it. It wasn't seeing the eye and the nose, because that's about all you can see, a little bit of brown patch on that bear. And I realized later, it's because I had it so close in that everything's black, you didn't see anything with contrast to see an eye or a mouth or a head, because it was all the same color like the moose. When you have that thing where you have the same colors, a lot of busy colors, it may find the animal, then it'll lose the animal. So, and this one will do it more often than the other cameras will. So it more often have it because the sensor is different. Remember that. That does not mean that's bad. This is still a hundred times better than anything we've had before. So even with that said, this autofocus is phenomenal for the price range of this camera. I'd say 95% of the time, I do not have problem with the focus on this. I'll go animal eye detect, if I can't with that, I use single point. So these moose, I'm using animal, but most of the time I'm using single point because it, it's easier for me to just hit the antler, hit the head, hit the eye, because it's not a fast moving animal. So that's really the autofocus, phenomenal. Works great. Uh, it's amazing. It's a trickle down from the R3, from the $6,500 camera down to the $6,000 camera down to this one. So you can't beat that. Uh, the viewfinder. Once you get used to the electronic viewfinders, uh, they don't bother you. When I first got the first R5 and I looked through, it's like a TV. You have a little bit of drag with it, you know, in the, in the image. But just like your TV, when we first got the first uh, 1080p HD TVs, they were kind of freaky because you had the 3D effect. So our, our brains had to get used to those TVs. We're used to those flat CRTs for a while, at least for me. Um, and your eye gets trained to it. So your eye gets really used to these EVFs. This one is the dimmest out of the series because it is the lowest and its resolution is a little less and the magnification is a little less. I think the R3 is like 1.2, 1.3 magnification. And if you ever have a chance to look through an R3 EVF, it's beautiful, it's so bright, it's really bright. This one, if you turn the brightness all the way up, you're using it and you don't compare it to the other ones, it looks really good. I don't have much of a problem looking through this viewfinder, even right now, and it's great. But again, remember the EVFs, so you can see your histogram. You, as I roll my ISO, I could see it get darker and brighter. I can see my histogram move. So the EVF in here is really good. So don't let people tell you it's a bad EVF. It's great. It works, does what it's supposed to do. Looks good. If you compare it to a better one, yeah. It's the same as comparing a uh, 720p TV. I keep talking about TVs. Take a 720p TV and compare it to a OLED TV. You're gonna see a difference in the two. It's not that drastic, but what I'm saying is you can tell the difference. Uh, the old plasmas versus the OLEDs. Plasmas were darker, these are more brighter. Those are the type of things you'll see because of the different technology and the way it captures it. These are just little TVs, what they are. Back LCD is great. I've heard people talk about uh, the it has less pixels, but you know what? It's, it's still great. I can see everything I need to see in this LCD. Works great for me. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. Um, all the menus work great in it. Um, the controls, like I said earlier, you know, I have a video on about all the things. They were, you get real intuitive to them. I've got the R5, the R3, and the R7. All the controls are different a little bit. Uh, this one's a little closer to the R5 because it doesn't have that dial here, joystick and stuff. So it's a little bit, your fingers get used to that difference in the different cameras. So low light capabilities. I just had a video ad on that one. So I'll just go through it real quick in case you haven't seen the other video. This camera at your normal ISOs below 6400, even a low light is great. Uh, like I said, the last several videos were shot with this camera and this lens, a lot of them, and 7200 lens and the 500 F4. And even the studio is, is filmed with the 1435 F4 or the 16 2.8, the little RF lens. And it, works great. Uh, the image is beautiful. The, everything, editing the pictures is great. I have enough dynamic range to do everything I need to do. It's crisp, it's clear, it's beautiful. Now again, I'm shooting a lot, some really good glass too, that really helps. 
but the image quality on this is good. I, I have no problem if I just all I had to go shoot all day and they sent me somewhere where it's super like once in a lifetime to shoot an animal and this is all I had, I'd be happy. Uh, that, that says a lot for this camera. Uh, there's some other cameras I would have, I would be going, oh, this is gonna be a bad day. I may not capture the, the shot or I may not be able to get the quality of the shot I want, but this camera will. Above 6,400 to 8,000, 10,000, if you have a good light day, you'll be okay. Low light, at 10, anything above 10,000, uh, you're going to suffer with it. In the daytime, good light, you can get up that 12,800 and probably still be good. But I would say if you pass 10,000, don't use this. You know, don't push your ISO. Find something else to do. Drop your shutter speed, drop your aperture, do something. Get a faster lens, which means a lower aperture lens, and use that. So the image quality, that's kind of where it is with that. So we'll talk about hit rate with this camera. And it just means how many images I get at the end of the day that I have to throw away. I've had to throw away very, very few images due to out of focus, other than I screwed up, right? So like with the Fox, we had the pictures in the last video. I had to shoot such a slower shutter speed. I knew I was gonna have motion blur in some of the pictures, so I was gonna throw a lot out. But when I have my settings right to capture the stop, let me freeze the animal, or maybe if something I want blur, if what I'm intending to get the image with and what I know I could get, I can get it out of this camera. I, I don't really have a lot of throwaways. I've had a few times where it will, even my R5 will do it. My R5 did it a couple days ago because I hurt the moose. I had it where it was such low light, it was kind of jumping. It just it would stay on a subject and go blur because even that autofocus is phenomenal. We'll do it. This one was kind of, it would do the same thing. Uh, so the hit rate I would lose on this one was about the same as the other two cameras. Probably a little bit more when I had something that was, I was holding the focus button like I talked earlier too long. Uh, even when I do single point, if you hold it too long on a subject, sometimes it will jump off. And that's just because the sensor is not as good as the other two. So it doesn't have as much contrast to look for, for its AI and the, all the autofocus stuff. So it loses it and tries to grab something else. And then you have to make it get back to your subject. So the hit rate's really good. So most of that is mainly the pros of this. I did mention a little bit of the offshoot. So we'll go with the cons in this camera. Uh, the first thing on the cons for me is the weather sealing, okay? Uh, for wildlife photography. So you will have to invest in a rain cover for this camera. So if you have, and you always need to carry it with you at all times, especially here in Alaska, I've got it in the bag because I don't know, it's, it's supposed to have a chance of rain, 10, 20% chance for this evening. If it rains, I'll just pull it out, put it on, and I'm good to go. And those raincoats by Lens Coat, I've got some link probably down in the description for them. Really good to raincoat. It's it's uh, Gore-Tex and something else, and it's really tough, really hard. It goes on real easy, cinches around real easy, really great. Different sizes for them too. So the weather sealing is a bit of a problem. Uh, no image stabilization of the body. To me, that is a negative, but also not a negative. And the only thing it says a negative, if you have a non-stabilized lens, you have to be a little more careful with your shots, just like you had to do back, you know, seven or eight, ten years ago if you didn't have a stabilized lens. And But almost all of the new RF lenses are stabilized. So like the, the 100 to 400, uh, that's, you know, $600 or so, that thing's stabilized, so you're great with this camera. That's about all you got to watch for is making sure you have a stabilized lens. So that would be a negative, but it's really not that big a negative. And if you're shooting video, it has the uh, digital stabilization, which work, works really good when you're walking around shooting video with it. One more thing to be careful with is when you turn the camera off on the R10, one thing it does not do is when you change the lens, is you make sure you do it downward facing because the door, the shutter, you'll see does not close. So it's wide open, so dirt and dust can fall in here. So when you change out the lens, you take it off upside down, put it back on. Make sure you have it facing down when you put it back on, and you should be good to go. So that is a negative for this camera. With the sensor door does not close, so you have to be careful. So you may have to clean the sensor more than you want to, because stuff may fall in there. Another negative, and that is this guy the battery this battery for me when I'm doing because I'm out shooting all day long and I'll have this camera on all day long and I'm getting probably three to four hours out of this on these RF lenses but I've got my 500 f4 this battery may last an hour and a half two hours because that pushing that big motor 
a little less with this one is probably about three hours with this lens but that's using it with the lcd on because i i leave this lcd on in the back i use the lcd on in the back of this to see my settings if i need to look down at my aperture to make sure i'm set right a lot of times because a lot of times i'll be shooting and i may have bumped a button on here and i look down and i'm shooting one two fortieth and i need to be shooting a one sixteen hundredth i could see that real quickly on the back and i can see my aperture because a lot of times when i have this dial this uh, control ring set to my aperture i may have bumped it also like right now it was sitting at seven one and it should have been sitting at four five and so th the battery will drain quicker by having this lcd on so if you turn that off and turn around you get a longer battery life out of it i don't so the battery life's that by that battery life being not as good as the R7 and the R5, the other cameras I got, because they'll go for most of the day, probably two thirds, three quarters of the day, you know, five, six hours. And with the R5, I have the dual batteries in it, so it lasts about a full day. But I've, when I get really good after it, it only lasts about seven hours, and I've got to switch a battery out. But since this battery, it's hard to find right now, I only have one of them. So it has become a bit of a uh, issue. The uh, the moose battle, this camera died 10 minutes after I got done shooting those last moose. So I didn't get any more sunset shots on them, but you know what, it was a long day. I'd been out there probably about eight hours already. So I was pretty tired and hungry and ready to go home and uh, or go find food. So it didn't hurt my feelings that the battery died on the camera. And uh, I had the actually R7, with, no, the R5 with me, excuse me, I didn't have the R7 back at the time. So I was out shooting some pictures with the R5 and other ones with the R10. And I use the R10 for the more uh, crazy moments of the fighting, the tussling, the video. So it lasted probably about four, four and a half hours, I think that day. So it did pretty good. And most of you may not shoot that long. So the battery may not be an issue, but not be able to find a second battery right now. Um, I found them once and they ran out. There is a third party battery for these. I don't risk third party batteries. I never use them. Some people have. There's a chance the voltage or something could go wrong, could fry your camera. And that's just my opinion. Everybody else, your mileage may vary. So that, you use it at your own risk on the third-party batteries. So the battery is a bit of an issue on this one. Uh, another con I talked about a while ago is no C-Log3 in here. The only 10-bit is an HDR for video. Most of you, like I used to be before I did the YouTube, I could care less about the video. I cared about the stills, and that was it. But no C-Log3, if you like to color grade, you want to up your game but if you're running this camera as your only camera you're probably not pushing that far yet you can use the 10-bit hdr be fine uh, not color grading is not going to hurt you you're probably worried about your stills and trying to up your games there and upping your game does not mean the camera a lot of times uh, vanessa joy great video channel she's a wedding photographer mainly but she does this bu bargain uh, budget camera they get some old cameras i think they use the m50 mark one both of them used and they went out her and another professional guy taking pictures the pictures are beautiful so gear does and gear does not matter at the same time if you know what you're doing you can shoot with any gear and get good pictures um, i tried to prove that using some of those more budget lens to show you that yes you can get get images out of those not that I'm saying i'm the pro or anything it's just try to work on your craft and, and if your gear any of your gear is going to take good pictures so what's my verdict and final say on this camera? For the price range and where it sits, it's a great camera. Uh, you can't beat it. Uh, none of the DSLRs prior to this one besides the 1DX Mark III and the Canon line could touch this camera. That, and that's saying a lot for a $1,000 camera, entry-level APS-C. Uh, you know, the frame rate it has, nothing could touch it prior to this. Uh, especially the price range. I don't think there's anything that would touch the frame rate on this camera in the price range it is. Uh, the dynamic range is really good. The video is phenomenal. The autofocus is out of this world, especially for this thing. There's some times, if you just want to talk about the cons, sometimes it may fluctuate on a little bit. It may jump off, but you can overcome that real quickly. Um, just hit the single point, get on something close to it, and hit the eye focus to go right back to it. Real quick and easy to do. Uh, like I said, the image quality is great. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, the cons, no IBIS. Just make sure your lens has stabilization. You overcome that con real quick. Uh, battery life is not great, but for most of you shooting, that battery life's gonna be more than enough. If you can find another battery, even better. Secondary batteries, keep it charged. That's what you'd always do with all your cameras. Keep a second battery charged. Um, 
that's about it. Uh, in the low light, yeah, you gotta watch your light. You can't push it as far as you can other cameras, but uh, we thought that was gonna be the case with the R7, and we were pleasantly surprised that we didn't have to have that problem with the R7. It could push a lot higher than we thought it would. This push is just as good as any of the DSLRs and the 7D and some of those. So it is close to the full frames, which is, is pretty nice. Uh, but again, guys, great camera for the money. If you're just getting into DSLRs, into the mirrorless world, this would be a good camera to grab at $1,000. You could pair this with the 1 to 400 RF. And now you're sitting at probably $1,600, $1,700. You can add a Nifty 50 for $300 or add a 16 millimeter 2.8. That's another $300. So for two grand, you could have a full system. For $2,000, you could have a great system that will shoot anything. You can shoot your landscapes, you can shoot your animals, you can shoot portraits and family with those three lenses plus this camera body. Just great. Um, couldn't beat it. Phenomenal. Uh, so that's my verdict on this camera. It's really, really good. It has a few drawbacks, um, but those are nothing you can't overcome, especially with the price you're in and you're probably just starting out. You've got somebody new to shooting or you're just moving out of the uh, DSLR world. You just want to put your toe in the water. This would be a good camera to get because you could grab this camera body only, get the adapter and use all the lenses you already had for your DSLR and be golden. Uh, that's it guys. That's my review and my thoughts on this R10. Uh, if you like, please share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the next episode.